Thank you for joining this talk uh, with, I think, probably the most uplifting title of, of them all. Tools and methods are killing your products. And I guess you didn't know that because otherwise you weren't sitting here. So I'm Ivo, I'm a designer at uh, Luminous and I'm uh, sorry. I'm sorry that I'm a designer because that means that I won't be showing any code examples in my presentation. So I hope you don't mind. There will be loads of other good stuff though. So um, stay put. Um, for the past 20 years, I've been designing digital products for a broad range of clients. Um, I've worked for clients for, for small startups, local startups, but also for uh, large established international brands. I've worked in domains ranging from energy to education, from agriculture to healthcare. And during these 20 years, every day I tried to learn something new. And that's because I believe that you cannot be the best at what you do if you only do what you are best at. Now, take a moment. Let's take a moment to think about that. You cannot be the best at what you do when you only do what you are best at. And that's especially true in our profession, in our domain, where things change so rapidly. I believe that you need to step over the boundaries of your everyday job description to keep up with all the change. Otherwise, you'll get old very fast. So that's also one of the reasons why I stand here before you today, talking about what I do. But that's also the reason why I sometimes try to code. Um, not because I think that will make me into an engineer, um, but I do believe that will make me into a better designer because I understand the materials I work with a little bit better if I kind of tried to code. So today, um, as the title of the talk already uh, indicates, I'm talking about how tools and methods are not always beneficial to your product. They might even sometimes hurt your product, hurt the end result. Um, over the years, um, as I've been working as a designer, I've become aware of um, some recurring and damaging patterns in the way development teams tend to apply these tooling and these development methods. And that's what I want to share with you today. But let's start with a short ego trip down memory lane when I was 16 years old. When I was 16 years old, I did not want to become a designer. No way. I wanted to become an artist. I had, I had discovered this natural talent for drawing and painting. I was really into the visual arts, man. Um, but most importantly, I wanted to become the opposite of my father, who was at that time a software systems designer which was the most boring job I could imagine when I was 16 years old. So I went to art school. I went to art school. And to make a long and kind of exciting story short and kind of boring, in the end, I did not make it as an artist. Despite all techniques and skills I had acquired and the fact that, that I could now basically create anything I could imagine, I just could not imagine enough. So I ended up being a designer after all, like my dad, and it turned out to be a pretty amazing job. So I'm glad things turned out this way. And like I already said, um, today I design mostly digital products. And most of the time I do that as a part of a multidisciplinary development team. Now, one of the things that I've learned being part of these teams is that advanced tooling and so-called proven 
development methods are in no way a guarantee for a successful end result, for a successful product. So today I will talk about four of the most common symptoms that I have experienced of these development teams that have gone astray. And I will also share some ideas on how I think to prevent this from happening, to get these teams back on track. So the first symptom, here it is, I call the scrum pendulum. Um, when I think about product development and scrum, I think about two things, basically. I think about the product being developed, obviously, and I think about the team that develops the product. Now, these two things live in completely different worlds. The world of the product is ruled by business goals and by user goals, depending on who you ask. While the world of the team is ruled in Scrum, is ruled by sprint goals. And these are not the same kind of goals. The goals of the user and the business are of little value uh, for the team. And vice versa, the, the goals, the sprint goals are of little value for the product. Of course, they they they, they match to each other, they they add to each other, but these are different kind of goals. For instance, a user goal could be to easily get a cup of coffee just the way I like it. While a sprint goal could be to implement authentication. That's a different kind of goal. The one can do without the other, but these are different things. Now in Scrum, the team works in short iterations. I guess you all know that, they're called sprints. And with these short iterations, the product is developed in small steps, which minimizes risks and maximizes agility. And that's great. Scrum basically is great, but there are just some pitfalls and I will come to that. <laughs> so the whole process goes a little bit like this. So during a sprint, the team develops some new features or functionalities that are after the sprint implemented and released to the product and this triggers some kind of response from the user and or business. And this response is then translated back into potentially new product requirements that are fed back into the development process. And this goes on and on and on. Now, during this process, the development team itself tends to get trapped inside this sprint bubble. That's what I call the scrum pendulum. They are focused, hyper -fo they have a hyper focus on the sprint goals. They're un unaware of what their work is doing to the product and they're unaware of what the product is doing to the user and the business. So the only thing that connects the development team to the product is this guy here or girl in the middle, the, the PO, the product owner. As you can see, he has a pretty important, pretty crucial role in all this because he is the one who uh, is responsible for translating user goals and business goals to product uh, requirements. And he's also the one who decides whether or not new functionality uh, uh, is fit to be released to the product. So you can imagine that if this, this product owner fails to do a good job, the whole process fails. So you could call this product owner, this PO, you could also call him an SPOF, a single point of failure, which is something that my own dad taught me way back. That's something you need to avoid in complex systems. So how can we, how can we avoid this product owner from becoming a single point of failure in Scrum? I believe that um, 
as a development team, you have your own responsibility to define what success means to you. When do you think you have done a good job? When do you think the product you have created is successful? So you might not all agree on this within your development team, especially in multidisciplinary teams. And engineers might, uh, might think uh, other things are important than, for instance, designers. But that's even more reason to talk about this and to establish some kind of common understanding on, of, of when you as a team think you have done a good job, when you as a team think you're successful. Because then you can every once in a while use this standard of your team to measure how you are doing. How, are, how, how, how am I doing? Uh, measure to our own standards. Um, so, for instance, as part of the standard could, for instance, be if, if you're developing an app, this could be a, a minimum of four-star rating in an app store. That's really easy to measure. There are, of course, other examples. You could also say, well, I think that our product should be uh, very uh, usable, uh, user-friendly. Those are things that are a little bit less easy to measure, but still, these are all things that can be measured. So as a team, by measuring it, you learn what the consequences of the choices are that you've made inside the sprint. And use these findings to learn from them. Now, this outer loop you create with this um, prevents the scrum pendulum from happening. And uh, it also serves as a fallback for a failing or non-existing uh, product owner. So summarizing the scrum pendulum, what is it and how can you prevent it? It is that the team is trapped inside a sprint bubble. And um, because it's trapped inside the sprint bubble, it gets detached from the product. You don't want it. You don't want it to get detached from product, business, or user. The product owner, therefore, becomes the single point of failure, which is dangerous. We don't want like danger, so we want to prevent, free, prevent this. And we, you prevent it by defining what success means to you as a team. Measure your success and learn how your choices have affected your product. On to the second symptom. Now, despite this title, you might think this is about Jira, right? Or Jira, if you prefer that. Uh, it's not. It's actually about uh, issue management tooling uh, in general, but Issue management toolings hammer just didn't sound right, so I chose Jira's hammer. So here we go. Products, digital products or any product, don't just magically appear out of nowhere. You know that already. They always start somewhere. They start with a vision, with a product vision. What is a product vision? It's a, a, a sketchy, somewhat abstract notion of what a product should or could be like, right? Now, you cannot hand over such a sketchy concept to a development team and ask them to build it. It just doesn't work that way. It's just too sketchy. They wouldn't know what to build. So, something needs to happen first. And this, this, beautiful, this beautiful vision, this beautiful product vision um, should, be, should be treated before it can be handled by a development team. So this is what happens. The beautiful product vision gets shattered to pieces and the little pieces are then being put into Jira, all neatly described, so the engineers know exactly team knows exactly what they need to build. These are the parts, and this is what they should do. 
So this is what happens next. Developer A, let's call him A. Developer A picks up the first piece from Jira and starts developing it. Now, it was very neatly described, so he knows exactly what to build. And here it is, a new product is born. It's beautiful. Developer B, let's call him B, uh, picks up the next part from Jira. And it was also very good described, very well described. So he can also do a perfect job. And he integrates his work with the work of developer A in the way he thinks is best. So you already start to see to grow that, that something beautiful is growing here. And this goes on and on and on. And the product grows until it's kind of finished. So here it is. It's a, a new product. It looks beautiful and it kind of resembles the original product vision, or does it? No. Well, no, no, it does not. And that's no real surprise that the team could have made any combination out of these parts, could have made a lot of different products because they had no idea where they were actually going. They had no idea of the original product vision. It was never shared. The only thing that was shared with the team was the items, the separate parts in Jira. They knew exactly how to build a part, but they did not have any idea what the role of that part inside the whole product was, or for that matter, what the goal of the product is. So how can you build something that resembles a product vision if you have never seen it and have never considered the major goals of your product? So this is how I think it should, it can be prevented, this Jira's hammer. I think that if you put things in Jira, Jira is great, issue management tooling is very important, it makes things manageable, um, which is important. Um, but do not only describe the parts in Jira, do also describe, please also embed them, uh, for example, embed them in, in real world user stories. So do not say, as a client, I need to authenticate so the system knows who I am. Although that's true, much more value lies in something like this. As a client, I need to authenticate so I can quickly and effortlessly get the coffee just the way I like it. Oh, so that's the goal you need to achieve. That's important information for a designer, an engineer, a development team to know how to build the right product. If there are any, uh, if there are any uh, uh, research findings, for instance, you can also, in, you should, I think you should also include those in Jira uh, because it, they explain um, not only the solution, but also what problem they should solve in detail. And if there are any sketches, any artist impressions of a dot on the horizon of the of the, of, 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 the, of the product vision, they should also be in JIRA. So everybody knows which direction you're headed as a team. So, summarizing. JIRA's hammer. The final product does not match the initial product vision. That's a problem. And part of the problem is that the development team integrates parts the way they think suits best. And that's okay, but if they're not well enough informed, they might make the wrong decisions. So make sure the development team is aware of this big, big picture so they can make the right decisions. Um, don't just describe what to build, but also explain why. And I believe, I think it, it works best if a development team partly owns this vision. If they get incorporated into the process of create, creating and developing this vision. Before I uh, go on to the next um, uh, 
uh, a symptom, um, which is called the swamp of continuous delivery. Uh, let me ask you, who remembers this game? Nearly everybody, I think. Yeah, yeah. Also, I expected that. I've played this did this a lot as a as a as a, as a kid already. Um, I, I still play it with my uh, kids uh, today. And um, despite uh, this man's face, it's really a fun game. Um, you wouldn't say, but I think I think you. It's still in the stores uh, today. I believe. I ho hope they have updated the the box. But um, it's a really cool game. It's uh, well, if you, you you've all played it, you, then you remember how it goes. You you put in the, the coins at the top, and you need to to get these coins to the bottom tray as fast as you can by turning these wheels with these slots. And if I turn the wheel, the wheel of my opponent also turns, which is kind of annoying, but that makes it f fun. Um, this guy doesn't think that's fun. Uh, why I'm showing you this picture, you might ask. Well, I believe that. This is a very accurate model of how product development uh, works. Because in product development, you always have different people, different departments, different expertises that are working together um, to achieve a single goal. So if you picture a company with different departments that need to hand over work to one another, then you start to see oh how it fits into this 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 game. But let's take a look at that uh, in a bit more detail. So let's picture this wheel. This this is this is one of these wheels, right? It's only one wheel. It's a really easy game. This um, this 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 wheel is uh, the wheel of the development team. And um, so if I feed the development team and an uh, in issue or yeah, a little piece of work it gets processed and it gets deployed to the product that's beautiful right that's basically what we do every day um but we're talking about continuous i'm talking about continuous delivery here so in continuous delivery this is also true but this wheel is constantly turning at a constant rate and um, constant, constantly uh, is creating value, is adding value to the product. So um, notice how the wheel runs at a constant speed, but also notice how the slots are always getting filled at the top and the, uh, the, the end results all always delivered, deployed in time. Uh, at the bottom. It's a constant, sustainable, and reliable stream of awesomeness to the product. It's awesome. People keep telling me, continuous delivery is awesome, man. I do. Um, so I believe them, because let's take a look at the, comp at the competitors, at the competition of continuous delivery. At the left, your left as well. Um, at the left, we have waterfall. Total bullshit from the past, but there you have uh, you 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 de de developed the, the the product as a monolith, and you spent way too much time de developing something that you released in a big bang release. After which you often find that this was not what the client or the customer wanted. Scrum is already a lot better. Um, the product gets developed incrementally in sprints, like we saw before, so it's much more agile and. Uh, there's a much bigger chance that you're building what the client, what the customer wants. And with continuous delivery, you're even more agile. Each, each issue, each feature has its own release. There's a constant stream of awesomeness. So that's great. But now let's make it a little bit more difficult. Um, like I said, this game of slaughter would not, it's called slaughter or onderuit would not be any fun if there, if you only had one wheel. So that's also true for development of products. Would not be any fun if it was too easy. So we have different departments, different expertise is working together. So 
If I'm talking about a constant stream of awesomeness, this is how it, look like, it looks like. Ah, it's really awesome. I can look, well, I guess a few seconds and still I'm intrigued. Um, so let's say that, for instance, I, I, I made just a random division here, but I said that the, P, the product owner uh, this is the first wheel on, on, on top. And that wheel feeds the wheel of the development team, which is kind of obvious. And the development team processes the features and, and the, the work, uh, which then hands over to DevOps, maybe some testers over there, and they make sure everything is deployed in a right manner. So this, this, this is all running very smoothly. This is how we all hope uh, uh, how we all hope that continuous delivery uh, works. Um, but as you see, the, these wheels are all turning in perfect sync. So the handover is also perfectly timed. There are uh, no empty slots. Yeah, well, there are empty slots, but every slot gets filled uh, at the right moment in time because all these wheels are running in perfect sync. Um, but remember, these wheels, in product development, these wheels consist of people, real people, who are going to, like, like us. And we are all real people, I presume. We're all going to real parties, drinking real beers, getting really drunk maybe, and, and having to get up really early in the morning to your very real jobs. And, well, you can imagine, you, you know how it goes. These wheels do not turn at the same rate every day. This is not a constant process. This is not a machine. These are people. So you can imagine these wheels not always running in sync. So what happens if, for instance, the top wheel, the product owner, he had a great party last night, and is not running at the speed he normally does. What, what, what will happen? Well, I think two things can happen. If he's not rotating fast enough, if he's not working fast enough, there will be empty slots in the development team. And empty slots in the development team means engineers doing nothing, only burning money, going to conferences. Well, who wants that, right? Nobody needs that. Um, so, and especially the product owner, he doesn't want that, so he makes sure he, 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 he runs a little faster, uh, uh, even though he's still a little bit too drunk. So he hands over his work prematurely just to keep the pace, to keep up the pace of this well-oiled oiled machine. And that's where it often goes wrong. To keep up the pace, issues are handed over prematurely. And in the end, that means the wrong thing gets built. And you don't want that. So, um, and it could also be um, that the, the resources you have at your development team are too little, but maybe sometimes also it's, you have too many developers for the product owner. The product owner <laughs> does not have enough time to get his issues uh, uh, prepared. Uh, so, the product, uh, product owner needs more resources or you need to, to shrink the development team. Um, you need to be flexible uh, to get this configuration right. So st still I think uh, continuous delivery is, is an awesome uh, idea if it, if it works, if you get it working. But I think the main goal, the, the best thing of this continuous delivery is that, that you can be uh, very, very, very agile. Because you, um, when you deliver a single piece of work, you can immediately, Im immediately measure whether it has the effect that you, that you predicted, that you wanted. And if it doesn't have that effect, you can immediately patch that or roll it back. So it makes you extremely agile. But a lot of companies still only think in this direction. 
from the company um, 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 inside out, so to say. So they only think about the, 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 they think about this process as as uh, uh, getting issues from their backlog, and that's not what continuous delivery or agile is about. You need to have a feedback loop loop and use this information. So what is uh, what, what's the result of my work in the product, in the user, in the business? And what does that learn me? What, does, what can I learn from that? And do I need to reorganize my backlog, for instance? Does that, and that mean something for the next issue I will be picking up as a product owner? So this feedback loop is crucial. If you don't have this feedback loop, why would you have continuous delivery uh, at all. Summarizing. The swamp of continuous delivery means that different parts of the organization are not running in sync, causing lower throughput then, and the wrong things getting built. There's no agility if it goes wrong. Huh? The continuous delivery does not, it, many times it does not go this wrong. You can prevent this by maximizing synchrony. You do that by balancing your resources, gathering feedback from customers, and be prepared to act on that feedback. And the last thing, I believe, might be the most important one. On to the last symptom. And it seems uh, I'm pretty, I'm a little bit faster than I predicted, predicted so maybe we'll be the first at the bar. That would be great, right? Uh, I'll do my best for you. So the prototype Mirage. Mirage. I like that word. Uh, prototype I also like because it's part of my everyday job as a designer. Remember, I'm a designer. So prototypes are a big thing for me. Um, but there are also a few things you need to keep in mind as a designer, but also as an engineer. I believe uh, you have to set certain standards for your designers you work with regarding to the prototype work they deliver. I'm talking about uh, um, user interface uh, uh, prototypes here. I'm not talking about uh, technical uh, pr uh, proof of concepts or prototypes. These are purely my everyday work. So I think these prototypes are great. It's a great tool. So let's say, for instance, this customer uh, really looks like uh, the designer guy, but this is the customer and he has a question. He asks, let, let's pretend that's me, this designer. And he asks me if, uh, he, if I can design a product for him that will get him from A to B. Now, just to make that clear, no client ever has asked me to build a product that helps him getting from A to B. Clients don't ask these kinds of things, but let's just pretend in this case, just to make this clear, that he asks me to build a product that gets, me fr that gets him from A to B. So uh, then I, I will ask him some smart questions like, like why do you want that? And do you like to go alone? Uh, or some other really smart questions. And then I can get to work and uh, create some ideas. Now, and if I have what I think a good idea, I might like to share that with my client just to validate if I'm on the right track. So I could tell him about my idea. Well, I have this great idea. It will get you from A to B. It's really cheap and fast. So uh, should I go on? And then he might be enthusiastic and say, okay, go ahead. But if I would show him a, pro him a prototype, like for instance, this thing, the, the boat, then the customer might be less enthusiastic because he might, if, if I just told him the, of the idea, he might not have realized that it's a boat that I'm trying to build for him. 
he might just think, oh, well, it's a craft that gets me from A to B. That's, a, that's cool. But if, he, is he, if he's, he's afraid of water and he, he, forget to, he forgot to mention that in the beginning, then this prototype has already served, served its, its pur purpose. So prototypes, I think, are great, are great because they reveal the questions that you should have asked, but you forgot or you were not aware uh, that they were relevant questions. Because you cannot know what questions are relevant, especially if you're making a new kind of product, if you're, if you're innovating. Words cannot do that. So, uh, another situation, <clears throat> maybe, after this, uh, after this first meeting with the first client, I get to meet the other stakeholders. And if I just tell them a good story, blah, 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 I go craft, it will get you from A to B, it's cheap and fast, they might all think, well, well, that sounds cool. You go ahead. But they all think, they all think they, 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 they understand me, and at a certain level they do, but they all have a different picture of what it is that I'm thinking of. So I should show them, this is what I'm thinking of. And then they all should know, oh, well, that's what he's thinking of. I think it's a good idea. Go ahead. Or it's rubbish. That's also good to know, <laughs> especially in the beginning. So this, this, this are all uh, um, examples of why I think prototypes are, are a good tool. But um, prototypes can also sometimes be a false promise. For instance, if I have shown this prototype to my client and the stakeholders, and I, it, it got them all excited, um, it goes on uh, to the development team and, well, let, let's build this thing. But if it, the most, most, of, most of the design jobs I get uh, before I start designing, the team and the budget are already set. So very rarely it, is it so that I first design something, then we see, okay, well, for to build a plane, we need that, that, and that kind of engineer. Let's put together a team. It rarely happens. So most of the time, um, this team is already known. So the expertise is inside this team and the budget for this team are also already known. So if I create a prototype, I need to take that into account because otherwise this will happen. A beautiful paper plane will turn into a, a opgekropt piertje. Um, how do you call it? A paper a ball. Um, and th that's, of course, a big disappointment for your client. I think a good example of this are uh, uh, prototype cars at um, this uh, salon of, v what is it, Vienna? I don't know, but this car salons. There are these big car shows and all the brands show their latest and greatest prototype cars. So in, I think it was, Mm, 2007 or I don't know I don't remember exactly but the Chevrolet Volt introduced their uh, first model of their electric car and that's shown on the top and it got everybody very excited not because it of, of course also because it was electric but it also looks really cool so but after it went in production and People start considering the costs and the aerodynamics and all these minor stuff. <laughs> the, the design got really watered down. Now, this is something that's also really uh, very understandable why this happens. Because over there, we're still selling a concept. And over here, we're trying to market this concept as well to make people buy the product. And then it should not be... Uh, too expensive, then it should be economic. Uh, it should not. Uh, uh, well, it should be an interesting proposition for for the market. 
Um, so between this and that, a lot happens, but you got to keep your client involved why you change your ideas from that first prototype after you go into production. Otherwise, it will be a di big disappointment. Another thing that can go wrong, and it's kind of, kind of the same as, as the last, but also kind of different, so, um, is that, I, that in a prototype, you present a, a, an idea without considering uh, the context of the product that you're developing for. So, for instance, without considering the limitations of, uh, your, of your technology stack. And I think a, a good example of, of this is Microsoft Bob. Um, in uh, 1959, Microsoft developed a, 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 a skin, a layer over their operating system for novice users to make it easier for them to interact with the computer. And they called it Bob, I don't know why, but they did. And it depicts, it uh, translates um, your operating system into a house with rooms, with doors between rooms, so you get from one room to another room, with stuff in the rooms that you could interact with. You could go to the word processor, which was a note, little notebook on a table, and you, I don't know what the dog did, but there was a dog also. So, besides this being a really bad idea, um, it, it because, well, let's not get into why this was a bad idea from a user perspective, but in 1995, there were very little computers in people's homes that had the graphical ability to display these kinds of stuff, this kind of uh, interface. So um, this was never integrated into Windows, um, thank God. Uh, but the designers of this Bob, maybe the designer was called Bob, um, they uh, did not consider the limitations of the current state of the technology. Another thing that can go wrong, oh my God, a lot of things can go wrong with prototypes. Yeah, it, they can. So um, be aware of that. Um, sometimes in prototypes, it's really easy to get clients excited about prototypes because they finally see their idea come to life. And seeing something come to life makes you excited, but it does not automatically mean that it's a good idea. For instance, um, well, let's, I could propose to a client, let's build a plane to get, from, get you from A to B. Well, that might be a good idea if A is Amsterdam and B is Beijing. But if A is Antwerp and B is Brussels, then, oh, well, right, the, it still works. You can go by plane, but maybe there are other solutions that are more fitting. Um, an example from my own portfolio, I'm not ashamed to say that I too have made some mistakes uh, in my uh, career. Um, I've designed this user interface. It was for a, um, for a traffic configurator uh, that uh, was used to configure traffic lights at complex intersections. And the previous version of the software was just a big collection of, of, uh, um, of screens, of um, dialogues uh, in which sets of parameters could be set. And it was basically a big mess, very hard to learn. Uh, so the question was from, from the client to me was, well, let's make it more user-friendly. And uh, we also like uh, would like that it we that, to lower the, the 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 learning curve of this software because it was really complex to use. There were only a few guys at this company that could use uh, the, uh, that could actually use this software. So please make it more user friendly. So one of the first things I proposed was 
well, okay, let's make it less abstract. Let's uh, include a, a, a map of the, inter of the actual intersection that you're configuring. Because then you know what all these abstract parameters relate to. So if I change something here, I see, oh, well, that's that traffic light. Okay, then I can reason about it. And um, I showed them my idea. I first showed them to the marketing people. And they were enthusiastic, but I said, okay, of course you are enthusiastic because it looks nice and um, the, the, I bet you, you can easy, more easily sell it with a picture because it looks nice, but let's also ask the people who are going to use it because, uh, well, they need to use it. And they also liked the idea. Um, so it got in implemented in the end, but it turned out after a year of use that most users were not using this map anymore because in practice, it turned out that it just took way more time to map your model physically on this, on this, on this map. And you could far uh, more, for, you, it took a lot less time if they just used the old parameter pop-up uh, dialogue stuff to just type in all the parameters. Then they were expert enough to use it in, in that old fashioned way. Yes, the new uh, personnel, they learned a lot quicker by using this map, but also for them, after a year of using this map, they start using the old fashioned way. So maybe it did serve a purpose, but it might have been a little bit too much in this case because everybody got excited about the prototype. This last thing is what always happens with prototypes. If I really do my best with prototypes, as I always do, um, I can get a client excited about the worst ideas. And it's, it's a little bit because of that. what, what I said before, that they see their vision come to life for the very first time and they fall in love with it. They love it. And even if I show them some alternatives after the first idea, they don't even consider it anymore because they all have already decided this is what I want. This is exactly what I, this is exactly what I, 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 I had in mind. So it, the, I call this the duckling effect. You know, ducklings are, are said to, to do that, that the first living creature they encounter in their lives, they say, oh, well, that's my mother. So they will follow that creature around, even if it's not uh, a duck. And, well, I'm, I'm not saying that all my clients are dumb as, as ducklings, but it is a little bit uh, how it uh, is. Well, um, So, summarizing. Uh, Prototypes can very easily convince clients of solutions that are too hard, unrealistic, or overly complicated. And that's a danger every designer needs to be aware of. And I think every developer needs to be aware of as well. So this is how you can prevent it. And I think the last thing, keep prototypes ugly. Uh, I think that that's, that's a very important one. Of course, in the end, you want a, a, a beautiful design, but a prototype is not a design. A prototype is to validate is, 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 is to validate an idea. If people like the idea, then you make it beautiful, not before that. So they can also easily compare some ugly ideas. Well, um, those were the four symptoms I wanted to share with you today. Uh, are there any questions? Or are we hitting the bar early? Yeah, that, that's, that, it was actually the mother of Clippy that we saw here. Yeah, Clippy came after this. And um, I think, Clippy had multiple uh, personalities, right? 
you had a dark Clippy, but you also had an Einstein Clippy, which I never got, but also a, a, a paper Clippy. So yeah, so Clippy is, uh, I believe, the, the 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 only part that survived of this Bob project, and I don't know if we should be happy about this. But <laughs> go ahead. Hmm. That's a dangerous one. Are there any product owners present here? <laughs> okay. No, of course not. No, product owners are very important. Now, I, I really... Okay. <clears throat> um, no, I do not think that. But I do think it's important that the product owner does not become the single point of failure. I do believe that it's very healthy for your the dynamic within your team to have uh, to see uh, your development team as an equal partner. So as a product owner, you defend uh, the, the user goals and the business goals, goals, but as a development team, you also have some goals that have more to do with product quality, maybe, but also maybe with some user or business goals. And I think there should be a balance. There should be a, a healthy... Uh, conversation between these two and uh, so you also can keep each other on your a, a game yeah but your work is very different I think also the work of a product owner is very different from the work uh, of the development team um, Okay, well, it really depends, of course, how you how you have composed your team. That's never the same in any situation. But uh, the classic division, uh, in the classic division, um, the the product owner, uh, well, is the one that that's that's the, the, the translator and the um, the gatekeeper. So, well. Really interested to how you can combine these two, but maybe uh, at the bar we can talk about this a little bit more. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Are you a Scrum Master in Belgium? No, I'm not a Scrum Master. Uh, I'm a designer. Uh, but, but you work in a Scrum team? I sometimes work in a Scrum team. I, 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 I'm a, a consultant, if you like to use that word, but I work in a, a different projects um, all the time. For different companies. Uh, I'm asking because uh, a lot of the problems that you were, uh, the first three actually, uh, it, they are basically describing the Scrum Guide, how to, how to avoid them, how to not uh, allow your team to make those mistakes. So uh, that's why I'm asking. Uh, and, and, and second part of my question are, are those thoughts that you presented, because you, you seem as, as a very re reflective guy uh, about your own work, about your own process. Uh, so my question is, did, did you get those answers to, to those problems from the Scrum Guide or, or from your own experience? I have not, uh, um, I've, I've not read the, the Scrum Guide. Uh, I've, I've talked a lot with people who have, writ, uh, have uh, read this uh, Scrum Guide. Um, and uh, it's true that if you, uh, that, that, that uh, the role of a product owner or some rules that are described in the Scrum Guide can prevent these things from happening as well. But uh, what I'm seeing is that a lot of different companies are implementing this Scrum thing in very different ways. And not everybody is uh, interpreting this Scrum methodology in the same way. So uh, uh, these rules are not always implemented in the, in, in the, in the same way. And this is just uh, what I have experienced in various uh, uh, projects and the, the patterns, the re-emerging patterns that I see uh, uh, in, in, in different projects at different clients. Was that the last one? Good. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy your beers. <laughs>